Thank you for the opportunity for me to present our invited paper on variation tolerant uh, digital circuit design for printed or flexible electronics. Uh, my name is Joseph Chang and I'm from NTU in Singapore. The problem that we are trying to address today is about variations. We all know that variations when we print an element, a circuit, and a system, the variations are going to be very large. That's when we print. Now, what happens to the variations when we bend? Uh, what usually happens is that the variations become much worse and even possibly uh, intractable. So in this talk, we're going to explore a digital circuit design method. Uh, it's, a, it's rather esoteric. It's called the asynchronous logic design. And within the asynchronous logic design, there is a specific design method called QDI, which means quasi-delay insensitive. This is very different from the conventional synchronous logic design that's used universally today. So I'm going to describe the issues with asynchronous logic design and how we propose two methods or two different parts of QDI design to address some of these issues. And finally, I would summarize my talk. There are numerous uh, printing methods and we won't go into them, but suffice to say that the variations of elements such as capacitors, resistors, inductors, and uh, TFTs, the variations are very high. Of particular pertinence, uh, the variations of TFTs are very large, and the, some of the important parameters include the carrier mobility and 100% variation is quite common. And in terms of digital design, the on current divided by the off current, the ratio, uh, the typical variations is more than 10x. Of course, there are some very specialized processors that would have lower variations. Now, so we know that the variations are already very high when you print and then when it bends, it gets much worse. So we have a diagram here in the bottom left hand side, an unbent substrate, a bent substrate, the capacitor that's bent and unbent, the resistor, and then a printed circuit, and then a printed system, and when the substrate is bent. So let's now just look at the variations of printed elements. In this case, we are interested with the TFTs, the capacitor, and the inductor. So in the table here, the section which is in blue is the, the TFTs. So we look at how the variations increase when the substrate is bent at a radius of 1 cm, and the substrate when bent at 2 cm. You can see that the closer the radius, or the smaller the radius, that means it's more bent, the current, the IDS, current increases the variations. In case of the capacitor and the resistor, you can also see that when the radius is 2 cm versus the radius in 1 cm in the part in pink, uh, the, rate, the variations increase when the radius is smaller. This is as expected. Now, let's look at TFTs. This is more of our interest in digital circuit design. So we have a substrate on the top left-hand corner, which is, which is unbent, and a substrate which is bent. So the TFT on the left-hand side has a convex shape, 
and the TFT on the right hand side is concave. So if you look at the slot at the plot which is at the bottom, when we plot the input output characteristics, you can see that when it's concave, you get a curve that's sharper, and then when it's flat, it's less sharp. And when it's convex, it's even lesser sharp. So when you look at the output characteristics, so if you look at, say, 60 volts, the variations when the substrate is bent in a concave fashion, the variations is 37% at 60 volts. And it gets worse at lower voltage. And when you bend the substrate in a convex fashion, the variations gets in the opposite direction and it goes at minus 26. So the net variation in this at 1 cm is 37 plus 26 from concave to convex, and that accounts to 63%. And that's a lot. And remember that this is in addition to the variations of printing. Now, what happens when you use these TFTs, which have high variations, and now we're just looking at bending alone? So if you look at this slide here, we have a ring oscillator, and we can design the ring oscillator in two ways. It's a diode-connected ring oscillator, shown in yellow, or the zero VGS-connected ring oscillator. So the ring oscillator is usually used as a benchmark on how fast your circuit can run. But we are more interested in the variations. At one cm bent, the radius is one cm, the variations become 46% in the output frequency for the diode connected ring oscillator and for the zero VGS connected ring oscillator, the variations become much larger at more than 100%. So now it becomes very difficult to design digital circuits because the variations are very large and remember that this is in addition to the variations at the printing point. Another way to look at how the circuit behave for a ring oscillator is to look at the time domain waveform and look at the oscillation. So we have in here uh, two plots. On the left-hand side, the radius is 1 cm. And on the right-hand side, the radius of the bending of the substrate is 2 cm. So we have the output voltage on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. So the black curve shows the clocking frequency when the substrate is flat. Now, when you bend the substrate in a concave fashion, the oscillating frequency increases, which is good. When you bend in a concave fashion, the oscillating frequency decreases. So what we are showing here is between the red line, the red plot, the black plot, and the, con and the blue dotted plot, is that the variations of the clocking frequency becomes very large in terms of variations. So you can see that now it is very difficult to design a circuit where the variations are very large. And we'll explain this in the context of, of the signal uh, protocols for conventional circuit design for digital circuits. Also note that if the variations are very large, uh, quite in some cases, the circuits become non-functional. We will now go on to the second part of the talk where we look at digital circuit design to accommodate the high variations from flexible electronics, particularly when it is printed. We present in here two fundamental digital design paradigms. On the top of the slide is the conventional single rail synchronous logic that's used everywhere today versus the somewhat esoteric 
dual rail asynchronous logic and so on in the bottom here. In the synchronous logic design for data computation, flip-flops FF1 and FF2 are data registers timed by a global clock shown as CLK here. For zero error or error-free operation, the period of the data synchronization of the clock is required to be set longer than the worst case delay of the circuit. Now put simply, for error-free operation, synchronous logic design assumes that the worst case delay is known. And the delays of all modules therein must be set longer than the worst case or the worst of the worst case. We will show later and, and also we described earlier that this is not the case because the variations may be intractable. For instance, you do not know how bent your substrate would be and how much variations would change with aging. So in other words, the possibility of error of the circuit not working is, is possible. To design circuits that are innately that innately accommodates uh, intractable variations, we propose to adopt the somewhat asynchronous, the somewhat esoteric asynchronous logic paradigm. Of this, the particular paradigm is called quasi-delay insensitive or QDI. This dual rail signal protocol is shown in the bottom part where the binary data bit now involves two wires, data true and data false. So what it really means in here is that the timing is embedded in the signal, in the data. So the encoding of the data validity and the converse, its absence, is innately encoded. So what happens now? Because the timing is encoded in the data, it's not a separate timing. No matter what timing happens, it is automatically accommodated. However, we will show later that this design has some issues. So the issues regarding synchronous and asynchronous, whether it's printed electronics or it's conventional CMOS, it's usually uh, qualified in terms of speed. Uh, for flexible electronics, delay uncertainty, and then the delay variations and the IC area or the printed area. So in terms of speed, it's not, it's not known which is better. But in terms of severe delay uncertainty, the asynchronous logic is much better because it innately accommodates the high variations. The IC area or the printed area for asynchronous is usually much larger, two to three times larger. But in terms of the overall context for overall feasibility, the asynchronous logic method appears to be more feasible. Before we get into the details of our design for the asynchronous QDI, in particular to accommodate the large IC area or printed area, if you look back on conventional CMOS, the severe delay uncertainty and delay variations over time, it is in fact very similar to very deep or ultra deep sub threshold circuits. For instance, if your threshold circuit of your CMOS transistor is 0 0.4 volts and you try to operate your circuit with a supply of 150 millivolts, the variations are also extreme. So these extreme variations in conventional CMOS can be viewed from a temperature range variation and the dynamic voltage variation. So I won't go into the details, but suffice to say that the problems that we face in flexible electronics, in terms of variations for digital circuit design, is somewhat similar to the deep sub-threshold uh, digital circuit design for CMOS.
Again, before we go into the details of, a, of our design methodology, our proposed design methodology, so let's look at a simple uh, system, an RFID tag. So uh, the RFID tag is well known. So if you look at the design here, what we propose to do is to replace the code generator with an asynchronous approach. So the problem here is that we normally expect the timing to be quite consistent, but because we are going to print the transistors, the variations can be very large. And the printed part would be the coil, the, the transmitting and receiving coil, the capacitors, and of course the TFTs and our code generator. So looking at the problem a little bit more in detail, so because we are going to print these parts, the ring oscillator, the transistor, and the code generator, if you look at the variations and we say if the VT variations are large, the mobility variations is 100%, and the I on, I off ratio variation is 10x, the probability of the synchronous RFID circuit our system would not work. So what we propose to do is to replace the parts shown here in red on the right hand side of the RFID. Instead of using synchronous logic, we propose to use asynchronous logic particularly QDI, and in this case, because the timing is embedded or encoded innately in the data, so whatever timing we have, it's automatically encoded. That means any variations would be accommodated. So without going into a lot of details, uh, this slide shows how we design our circuit. And the C here is the C Muller circuit that's used in conventional uh, quasi delay insensitive uh, uh, asynchronous logic design. So, to show how we realize our, the code generator in asynchronous logic QDI. Here are a couple of uh, pictures to show our printed circuits. Okay, we will now go into the details of the circuit design. So this slide shows you the overview of the entire landscape of digital circuit design. So on, on, the, on the highest level, on the design methodology, and the basic philosophies of design, as we explained before, there's the standard, conventional, synchronous logic, and then there's the asynchronous logic. And in the asynchronous logic, there are four different methods, but the one that is it's insensitive to delays or insensitive to variations is the QDI, the quasi-delay insensitive, and there are three ways of implementing that in terms of logic families. And the one that can sustain or can accommodate the high variations would be, of course, the static logic. And then within these three, asynchronous logic, quasi-delay, and static logic family, there are three or four different methods. So they are the QDI realization approaches. And what we, are, what we propose is the pre-charged static logic design. We will now present our first of two proposed approaches. The first one that we do is doing at the cell level. And we have this approach called the pre-charge static logic, PCSL. So the basic architecture is shown on the top and closed in red dotted lines. 
The basic architecture comprises an, an inverting static logic cell, three transistors, and two inverters. The three transistors are for output, pre-charge during reset, phase evaluation during the computation phase, and the two inverters are for output buffering. The outputs are QT, that's output true, and QF, that's output false. In PCL cells, when the request is zero, both outputs are zero. On the other hand, when the request is one, which indicates that an operation is ready and the input signals are valid, the operation commences and the ensuing output is obtained. The architecture of the PCSL involves an integration of the sub-circuit associated with the request signal and a buffer to each output into a standard static logic cell library or library cell, but redesigned for dual real logic, of course. So it shares uh, common transistors. This reduces the number of transistors resulting in simultaneous lower power energy dissipation faster speed and smaller area. Now, here we also show uh, on this slide the schematic of six PCSL cells and of particular interest, look at the slide, look at the cell which is on the middle left hand side, the N NAN uh, cell. Now to benchmark our design, Let's look at the competing methods. One is the DIMS, which is delay insensitive mean term synthesis. The second is the NCL, the now conventional logic one, and the now conventional logic two. You can see that the circuits are actually much, much more complex, and we shall now benchmark them. Now, Look at the problem that we are trying to address. We said that if you use asynchronous logic, particularly QDI, the method is highly possible for flexible electronics because it innately accommodates the high variations, in fact, intractable variations. But the cost of using this design method is power or energy per operation, speed, which is also delay, and the size of the area, of printed area or IC area. So the usual composite uh, figure of merit is energy times delay times area. So if you look at this table here, we have three parts, energy, delay, and IC area. So we tabulate the various parameters for a number of cells, digital cells, and we average them out, and we benchmark the, the different parameters with our proposed method, and we normalize our method to one. So when you look at the table on the left-hand side on the energy per operation, the PC, PCSL is, is normalized to one, and the DIMS method is four times higher energy, while the NCL is between 1.6 and 1.9. In terms of delay, the PCL again is most advantageous, while the other methods are four and approximately two. And the IC area, the PCSL, our method it's been, is normalized to one, and the area by comparison is 4.7 and about 2.6 to 2.7. In other words here, you can see that the composite index or the composite figure of merit is much, much higher for the PCSL. Okay, we come to the second part of our approach for asynchronous QDI design, particularly to Propose the method to reduce the hardware. That's also in terms of area, power, and speed. In a higher level circuit design, 
in terms of its uh, pipeline. So we, approach, we propose an alternative QDI approach, and we call this the pseudo QDI, and yet retain the robustness of QDI. The approach comprises a simplified asynchronous four-phase pipeline structure with our proposed PCSL, dual rail logic cells, which we described earlier. The salient feature between our proposed pseudo QDI pipeline and the standard QDI pipeline, which we call the true QDI, is the removal of the data completion detection, the DCD, while preserving the ledge completion detection, the LCD. Here we depict the true QDI. So to preserve its delay insensitive attribute, except for the fundamental isochronic fork assumption, the QDI pipeline requires to address the issues of input completeness and gate often. We adopt the NCLX pipeline because it requires a much smaller area and its realization of the data path is simpler. So in this slide, the adopted a synchronous QDI comprises a QDI handshake and a QDI data path, the QDI handshake, which is the I plus one. And this is shown here for illustration. So without going to too many details, it is well established that the area and energy overheads of the DCD is large, particularly if the complexity of the functional circuits in the QDI data path is high. Nevertheless, the delay overhead of the DCD is largely insignificant because the DCD executes in parallel with the functional uh, circuits. To mitigate the high overheads of the true QDI pipeline, this slide depicts our proposed asynchronous pseudo QDI pipeline. So what we do here is that the DCD, which is the data path completion detection uh, part, what we do is we propose that this be removed. And that's why we call this the pseudo QDI. Now, there is an implicit timing condition to satisfy the QDI. As the request signal is already integrated in our PCSL circuits, they immediately lend themselves to the pseudo QDI pipeline. The pseudo QDI pipeline operates exactly as its true QDI counterpart, except that the latch controller no longer waits for the assertion and deassertion of AVE, as in the true pipeline. This places an additional timing requirement on the reset cycle of the four-phase asynchronous operation, specifically that certain internal nodes must be set before the next cycle of the evaluation commences, in part facilitated by the fast reset nature of our PCR. So we have shown that because of our method of reducing this hardware, the energy is reduced by 40%, the area is reduced by 1.34 times over its true QDI, counterpart, and yet the operation robustness is largely retained. Now to end my talk, uh, I will now summarize what we have presented. First, we know that the variations of printed elements, printed circuits, and printed systems would be very large. That is at the point of printing. Now, when you bend the substrate, the print, the variations become even larger and possibly intractable. 
So there's also the effect of aging. So in other words, variations for flexible electronics, if you are printing the devices, it's a real problem, it's a real challenge. And when you look back at conventional CMOS designs, this problem is similar to ultra-deep sub-threshold designs in CMOS. So what we propose to do is, because the variations are very large and possibly intractable, we propose to explore the asynchronous logic versus the conventional and universally applied synchronous logic. However, the costs are very high when you apply asynchronous logic. To, circum to circumvent the problems with the high costs, we propose the pre-charged static logic at the cell level design, and we exploit this pre-charged static logic and modify the QDI uh, pipeline protocol, timing protocols, and we call it the pseudo QDI. So the overall area, power, and speed overheads become very significantly smaller. Thank you.